Hey guys. Um, here we are going to be talking about eyes and cameras. A lot of this stuff can be found in primarily if you're using a textbook uh, topics 4.1 and 4.2, a little bit in 4.3 um, when we talk about digital images. Um, you may notice we're skipping topic three. Topic three won't be done this year. Um, it's extension material anyhow. So um, I will skip topic two point, or sorry, topic three uh, for this unit. There will be a Bill Nye, a uh, link to a Bill Nye video I will put on. It's a pretty good one about light and color. Um, I do recommend you guys watch it. It will be optional like all the Bill Nye videos have been. But other than that, we're sort of skipping over that section going right into topic four. So this is the section where it breaks my heart that you guys are missing this. This is the eyeball dissection. Um, it's where we would be uh, slicing and dicing, opening up the eyeball, similar to how we would have done the rat. Uh, the rat, you guys would have just had to watch it. The eyeball, you guys would have been actually doing the eyeball dissection. So I will still post a video or a link to it. The nice thing is you stick it out in, at uh, St. Martin's and there will be another eyeball dissection. I believe they do it in grade, uh, grade 11 or grade 12. Um, it's just nice to have it, have you already done it in grade eight. Maybe some of you won't be taking biology, um, bio 20 or bio 30 or whatever it is. So um, watch the video, it's a good one. So we're gonna talk about the eye. We're gonna compare the eyeball to the camera and we're gonna be talking about the different types of eyes in the animal kingdom, um, things like that. It's a pretty fun topic, so here we go. So here we go, we're gonna start with the eyeball, okay? We're gonna start with the pupil. And we all know the pupil, we've heard the pupil is actually, you know, the, it's the black dot in the middle of the eye. And that's what it actually is. It's the opening of the eye, okay? And it lets the light in and out of the eye, okay? It's actually just a hole. And this is something we would have found during the dissection, okay? In class, I tell the kids, you could actually, if we didn't have the outer um, covering on our eye, if we didn't have the cornea and whatnot, you'd actually be able to poke your finger in through the, the pupil. When we did the dissection, we peeled the, the iris, which we're gonna talk about in a second, off, and you can actually stick your little pinky through that pupil. So it's just a hole that gets larger and smaller and allows light to go through. And you can't really see it here, but that's what it would be. It would be that, that hole right there. This is similar to the aperture in a camera, okay? The aperture in a camera uh, can change different sizes. Some of them occur automatically, others you have to adjust it to allow a different amount of light in, okay? So a camera works in a similar way, a piece um, a piece that acts like the pupil is the aperture. So this might be the quiz question, one of the quiz questions, what is similar to the pupil? Um, an aperture is a hole or an opening in the camera that lets the light in. Pupil and the aperture, so here's some terms, dilated and not dilated, okay? This right here, the small pupil, the pupil is dilated. And then this one, the aperture is closed down. So the pupil is not allowing that much light in. Here, the pupil is, sorry, this one's not dilated. This one, the pupil's dilated, it's opened up, it's allowing a lot more light in, okay? This occurs naturally. So you don't have to actually think about making your pupil get larger and smaller. Um, this is where we would be doing a little demonstration where I'd ask you guys to shut off the lights and look at the, I'd shut off the lights and I'd ask you guys to stare at the person next to you at their eyes and then you'd start giggling, going, oh, oh, oh they're cute, oh, ha, 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 right? But that, that's all fine a while and then I turn the light on and then you guys get freaked out. You're like, oh my goodness, the eye, the pupil got larger, it got smaller. Try this at home, okay? Go into your bathroom. Uh, going to a room, yeah, bathroom probably be a good one where you not don't have that much light in there. Get close to the mirror. If you can, shut the light off. Give it a couple minutes and then a, a couple seconds, a few seconds, 10 seconds or so, turn the light on while you're focusing um, on your image, uh, on your reflection, and you should be able to see that pupil get a little bit larger, okay? It, it happens because um, when the light, oh, sorry, the pupil gets smaller when you turn the light on because um, the light would be, there would be too much light going into that pupil. Okay, when you shut the lights off, the pupil gets larger because there's not as much light. Um, so the pupil gets larger so it can allow more light in. The aperture does the same thing. You can open up the aperture to let more light in, close it to less light, let light, less light in. Next we have the iris, okay? The iris is the band of muscles that surrounds the, the pupil, okay? And it actually controls the size of the pupil, 
Okay, so when you're you know, looking at somebody and you're like, oh my goodness, they got such pretty eyes. So it's not the eyes that you're looking at, it's, it's the iris, right? So if you're trying to, uh, you're on a nice date with uh, with uh, that special somebody, you know, you're at, at McDonald's or whatnot, sitting in that booth for one after social distancing's over, and you're sitting there eating your Big Mac, and if you really want to impress that other person, just look at them straight in the eye and say, my goodness, you have such gorgeous irises, okay? They'll think you're such a geek, they, they might dump you on the spot, right? I, I don't know. Maybe. Have fun with that. When people, So when people refer to their color, they're referring to the color of the iris, okay? In dim light, the iris opens up and the pupil dilates, becomes wider, and lets in more light. The opposite is true when the bright light, when there's bright light, the um, iris constricts, becomes smaller, the pupil becomes smaller um, to let in less light. This is very similar to the diaphragm in your camera, okay? So the diaphragm um, allows, uh, the diaphragm is a part of the camera that changes the size of the aperture. And you can see they're spinning it around right here. Don't mistake this with the diaphragm in the belly, right, or um, in, the, in the respiratory system, okay? This is a diaphragm that's more similar to the diaphragm in the uh, microscope we talked about. Okay, it varies the amount of light that can actually reach the film or the, the back of the digital camera, the charge couple device. Okay, in automatic cameras, a sensor detects the diaphragm to change its size automatically, and others, you have to adjust it. Okay, next we have the shutter. A shutter is like the part that controls, it's it, this is in a camera. The shutter is the part that acts like a control to control the amount of light entering the camera. It lies behind the aperture. And the longer the shutter remains open, the more light that enters the camera and strikes the film. Okay, what part of your eye is that? What do you guys think? Any guesses? I don't know. It could be anything. Okay, yeah, it's your eyelids. Next, we have the retina. And this is an important part of the eye, and this is it's very very important. Okay, it's actually where the image formation occurs. Okay, in order to see, light rays must strike a sensitive area in the back of the eye, and that sensitive area, as you can see back here, that's the retina. This is the most fascinating part of the dissection, when I, when, in my opinion, um, when, when we dissect the eyeball, is to find the retina, okay? The retina is a very, very thin, uh, thin lining of cells that just cover the back of the, um, back of the, um, the eye, okay? Um, and these cells have these special types of receptors on them. Okay, and these photoreceptors um, send or uh, send messages to the brain to help tell us what we are actually looking at. Okay, and you may have heard of these photoreceptors before. Um, they are very, very light sensitive, and there's two types. So I'm hoping you guys are thinking of what they are. I'm probably saying, okay, just tell us, pop in, or some of you are going and saying, oh, they're rods and cones. Okay, so the rods are very, very highly sensitive to light. So these are the ones that when there's not that much light, so the lights shut off and you're going around and it's dark out, you know, you're dark in the house, you're trying to sneak downstairs to the pantry to grab some food, you don't want to turn on the lights or whatnot. So it's just like the light that's coming through the window, everything sort of looks grayish and whatnot. These, that is because your rods are acting, okay? Because they're very sensitive to even small amounts of light, they can focus in low light situations. But unfortunately, you're usually just seeing shades, okay? So this is where in the classroom, I'd go shut off the light and I'd go and I'd say, okay, I can see so-and-so is, you know, can't see their bright red shirt, but we can tell they're wearing a shirt and it's kind of like a grayish color or a shade of, of gray, right? Cones are the photoreceptors that actually detect color, okay? So cones, they don't even function when the, there's low light situations. When the lights are dimmed, the cones are shut off. They're not working, okay? Um, so cones can't function in low light situations. But when there is light, the cones are what allow us to see those bright red colors or those bright pink colors and the nice shiny blues, all the different types of colors. The way I always remembered this, again, going back to my, my great memorization techniques, cones start with the letter C, the word color starts with the letter C, so I remembered it that way. Um, this is somewhat similar to the difference between color and black and white film or filters and cameras. Okay, black and white film filters can't detect or can't record colors. This goes to film. Some of you are going, like, well, what's film? No one knows what 
film is, right? Um, back in the day, back when I was in junior high, we actually took a uh, photography class. And in that photography class, we had to load our cameras with film and we had to go around the school, take pictures, right? And put pictures of your crushes or whatnot. And then you got to go and you actually developed, you didn't get the pictures right away. You had no idea what they looked like. You had to go and develop them in, in a dark room. And the pictures were recorded on something called film. Okay, cameras form an image in a, in a similar fashion. At the back of the camera, there's this photo, uh, photo sensitive film, okay? When you take the picture, it's very sensitive to light, so the light goes through, and depending on whatever we're taking the picture of, with the light uh, rays bouncing off the object going through the camera onto the film, it records the image, okay? And then you have to go and use chemicals to develop that image. So when the light, the light strikes the film, the film changes chemically forming an image, okay? Um, ask your parents. Some of you might have some film laying around at home, some old negatives, and you can take them, um, you can hold them up to the light, and, and you can actually see pictures, the images that are on the, it's on the film. It's kind of cool, okay? We don't use that anymore, though, right? I talk about film, you guys are like, what the heck, Pop? Okay, this is so old. Digital cameras don't use film. They have something called a charged couple device or a CCD. Okay, so we're going to talk about this again later in the in the next video. But a charged couple device is a uh, device that converts light energy into electrical energy. Okay, so it's kind of similar to the grid of graph paper. Okay, so um, all the light falls onto a certain spot, as you can see on the picture of this nice little basset hound. It's kind of like got grid paper here, and the different uh, colors form on that on those little uh, quadrants or those little squares this electrical charge is converted into a digital digital information numbers okay and once that image is converted into numbers it can be stored and that's how we get our pictures on our phones and on our digital cameras well, this is the technology now when our textbook was made film was the big thing digital was all new they probably wouldn't even have film or much about film on the new textbook if one comes out the next thing we're going to talk about is our optic nerve, okay? And the optic nerve, um, it's on the back of the eyeball. So when we do the dissection, I actually ask you guys to find the optic nerve. And it's a tough little uh, uh, tissue that's on the back. And the optic nerve is, oops, it's actually what the nerve that leads the, or connects the eyeball to the brain, okay? So the retina is right here. It's connected to the optic nerve. And this optic nerve goes right to the brain. If we were to go and cut my head off, pop it out, take an ice cream, ice cream scoop and pop out my brain, the eyeballs would actually be attached to the brain, okay? The eyeballs are actually part of the nervous system in a way because they're connected to the brain. Quite a few years ago, we weren't able to do the eyeball dissection because that mad cow disease came through, which affected the nervous system of the cow, and we weren't able to get the eyeballs because they put a, a stop on selling eyeballs because it was connected to the brain or to the nervous system. So when the light strikes the retina, the photoreceptors are stimulated and they send that message to the brain and it tells us what we, our brain tells us what we're seeing, okay? Um, it passes the messages onto the brain and the brain translates that message into whatever we're looking at, okay? Uh, there's a fun activity on page 233 in your textbook. Um, I believe that's the activity and it talks about finding your blind spot. The On the optic nerve, that's the only spot on the, uh, on the back of the eye, on the retina, where there are no photoreceptors. So actually, we have a blind spot, a spot on each of our eyes where we can't see, okay? So I'm looking over here right now. If I was to close one eye, there's something over here I cannot see. It's actually a blind spot because there's no photoreceptors on it. And if I close this eye, the same thing happens on this one. There's an activity in the textbook. I believe it's the one on page 233, which allows you to find your blind spot. Don't have to worry about it if we have two functioning eyes because the blind spot from this eye gets picked up from this eye if we have both of our eyes open. Okay. And it, yeah, kind of a fun act to be. So focusing light. Light obviously needs to be focused and it is ciliary muscles and our lens that help do that. Okay. Good vision and clear photographs rely on more thing, uh, on one more thing to make sure that the light um, strikes the retina or the film properly. Okay. Both the eye and the camera have a transparent lens. So when we did the dissection, you actually take out the lens, okay? And it's a small circular shaped, uh, if it was fresh, it would be clear um, cartilage type of thing. It's, it's pretty hard, but it can uh, bend back for it. Uh, we know that convex lenses collect light and direct it to a focal point. 
this is actually what the lens in our eyeball is. It's just like a convex lens that focuses that light onto the retina. Okay, the eye muscles, so we have our ciliary muscles, where is my close ciliary muscles right here, they relax, contract to change the shape of the lens, which adjusts the focal length to form uh, the focused image onto the retina. Okay, so here's our lens, the light comes through, light comes through, depending on the ciliary muscles and, and the lens, it gets bigger or fatter or whatnot, and it focuses the image right on a retina, and from there it sends that message to our brain. That's how we see, okay? The ciliary muscles, like I said, it contracts it, sort of pulls up and down, causing the lens to get bigger, wider, that type of thing. Not drastically, just a little bit, but just to allow the image to form on, onto, um, onto the retina. That's why sometimes you have to, you're squinting, you're pulling those ciliary muscles, uh, to tightening them to, so that the image gets focused a little bit better. Okay, so comparing both the eye and the camera, this is something that you might want to know, hint, 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 okay. Both of the images formed in the eye and the camera are upside down. You see this beautiful, but this was that research that I asked you guys to do for uh, for the pinhole camera lab. Okay, so right here we see a pencil. In both cases, they are looking at a camera, or sorry, they're looking at the pencil. It's got to go through the camera or through the eye. The light from the top goes through the pupil, does bend a bit so that it focuses right on the retina. The light from the bottom of the pencil does the same thing, focuses so it's over here. And in both cases, the image is upside down, okay? When we're looking at things, they don't look upside down. The reason they don't look upside down on in when we're looking at things is our brain flips them the right way, okay? So our brain corrects it. And even though I'm looking at my computer right now on the back of my eye, that computer's upside down, my brain tells me, no, it's not flip it the right way, okay? In a picture, okay, uh, the picture gets actually made, created upside down. We don't see it upside down because when we print the picture, that's the old thing that we used to do to get to look at pictures, we would just look at the picture the right way. Um, the same thing with the images on our cameras. They're actually upside down, but our camera, when we're holding it, they just project it so that it looks the right way, so that it's upright to us. So kind of cool. Um, this was the big research for the pinhole camera. Lab. Cool. So comparing the eye and the camera, okay, so we have the card or the retina. Um, we have the film or the CCD. Um, we have the diaphragm, similar to the iris, the aperture, similar to the pupil. Both the lens, there's lenses in both the camera and in the, um, the eyeball. Don't worry about this stuff. Okay, it's just the covering for the, the eyeball and the covering for the camera, okay? Know this slide. When we're doing your quiz, have this slide handy because you might be using it. I haven't created the quiz yet, but I'm gonna put questions from this onto the quiz. So correcting vision, okay? A lot of us, you know, we have these little four eyes, we got uh, glasses or we got contacts. People who are farsighted, there's two types of vision problems. There's farsighted and there's nearsighted. This is where we have the discussion. I always get mixed up with which one I am. But people who are farsighted cannot see close objects close. Okay? So if I was to take off my glasses and I wouldn't be able to see the things in front of me, okay, that means I'm farsighted. Things that far away, I can see them all right. The eye cannot make the lens fat enough to focus the light onto the retina. Okay? And the image actually ends up by falling behind the retina. So the image forms over here somewhere. Okay, People are new, nearsighted. The opposite is true. They can't see distant objects good. They can see close things fine, but they can't see objects far away. Okay, They cannot make the lens thin enough to focus the light on the retina. So the image falls in between the retina and the, um, the image falls in between the retina and the, the, the lens. Okay, so light converges through a convex lens and diverges through a convex, a concave lens. So we can use this to fix these two vision problems. Okay, so by putting these lenses, whichever one we need, in front of the eye, you can alter the angle that the light's coming in so that it actually appears onto the, uh, the image actually appears onto our retina. Okay, so people whose lenses cannot converge light enough, convex lenses are prescribed. And for uh, people who whose natural lenses focus light before it reaches the retina, concave lenses are prescribed. And here's a picture out of our textbook. So you see normal vision right here. We're looking at something from way over here. 
it bends, it goes, and it forms perfectly onto the retina. Okay, for nearsighted people, the object, the light comes through, it bends, and then the light continues on, but the focal point is sort of in the middle of the eyeball, so you end up by getting a fuzzy image on the retina. That's why everything looks fuzzy. For farsighted, the opposite is true, okay? The light starts to bend, okay? It doesn't converge yet. An imaginary convergent would be back here, um, so we end up by getting a fuzzy image on our retina, okay? These are corrected by just putting the proper lenses in, okay? You put the con, uh, concave lens right here, it causes the object to bend right onto the, onto the retina, and then down here, same thing, a convex lens, it bends onto the retina, okay? This picture would have actually been on a test. Um, I'm not gonna test you on it, but um, it's, it's a good idea. There might be a quiz question on vision problems, okay? Just not this exact picture. I don't know how to put pictures on D12. All right, another way to fix vision problems is laser eye surgery. Some of you may have heard of this. You may have had parents that have done this, okay? We we have a great discussion on this. I love this discussion, but we're not gonna today, okay? So the way, uh, so people that don't want to uh, wear contact lenses or wear glasses, okay, you can go through something called laser eye surgery or that LASIK surgery. Okay, so the way that works is surgeons will use laser to reshape the cornea. So they're reshaping the cornea, which is the outer covering of the eye, which does have refraction. Okay, so they would have reshape that cornea to allow uh, some refraction to occur before the, um, in the the light or the image hits your your lens. So the way they do that is they give some numbing drops. The person has to be awake. I've never had this before, but this is what I've been told. Person has to be awake. They cut a clear flap over the top of the eyeball and then using a laser scalpel they actually go and they reshape the cornea okay so once they reach the cornea they close the flap and then it heals itself like so and um you, you can see okay so after after surgery the shaped cornea acts as a corrective lens so before it actually goes through the to the your actual lens it goes through the cornea and there's a little bit of refraction awesome totally convenient super super um, easy to do apparently um I, i've been told in the past that you can only get laser eye surgery once um i've had other people tell me they've they you can have it more than once i don't know for sure i've got no desires to get laser eye surgery i do know that the eye because it constantly does deteriorate that if you get laser eye surgery it's not a fix for forever for some people it might be thankfully uh, but for others the eyes do constantly create and that's why we have to get our eyes checked every year every couple of years um so laser surgery may not be permanent but it's definitely a, a nice nice quick fix especially for people that don't like these okay so definitely when i was younger it would have been something i would have considered um if it wasn't so new back then okay so there's different types of eyes we've got camera eyes and the human eye like we just went over is very very similarly designed to the camera eye so that's why we're comparing it to that Okay, they're called camera eyes. We call these camera eyes, um, which are round and have a cornea, lens, retina, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of animals in the animal kingdom have camera eyes. In fact, most vertebrates, animals with backbones have camera eyes. Some invertebrates do as well, okay? So birds have sharper vision than humans because humans, we only have three types of cones. That's red, green, and blue light. Birds have five, so they can sense different wavelengths that we can't, uh, we can't even figure out. Okay. This means that birds sense more colors and shape than humans do, helping them survive and find food than when they're flying up in the air. Okay. An octopus is an example of an invertebrate, no backbone, that still also has a camera eye okay, with a lens, cornea, retina. However, the lens does not change shape to focus, move towards, uh, to, to move towards and away from the retina. So octopus, the octopi, their, their eyes are a little different. They're still camera eyes, but their lenses don't change the focus. So here, again, just gone over this. Here's a couple of different camera eyes, one of a fish, one of a human. If you actually take a look at them, a lot of similarities, but also some differences, okay? So if you take a look here, we have the outer layer. Our pupil and our lens, they are inside the eye. If we were to create this and complete the circle all the way around, our lens is actually within the eye. Fish, they're not, not fish have a large round lens okay, that actually protrudes out of the eyeball. Okay? And the reason for this is for an adaptation they've had. 
fish have their eyes or lens actually outside the eye so that they can see if there's any prey behind them or any predators behind them or prey. So make sure there's nothing behind them trying to come up with them. It's not like any meme where they have heads and they can turn around and take a look and say, hey, oh, they're a big shark. They have to have their lens that stops them, uh, that allows them to see. Okay, oh, look at the pretty kitty cat. Okay, so nocturnal. Many people say cats, so this talks about eyes, nocturnal animals, um, animals that are awake at night. Many people say that cats and owls can see in the dark. This isn't true, okay? No, no, no animal can see in complete darkness. Okay, nocturnal animals, okay, they are active at night, but just because they're active at night doesn't mean they can see in the dark. They have very large people. People can dilate the pupils very wide to allow as much light in as possible. So the light from the stars, the light from the moon, uh, the light from you know the street lights, they can use that light in order to see really well in low light situations. But if we were to snap our fingers and all the light was to be gone, we they wouldn't be able to see at all. Okay. They also have a thin air inside their eye. All animals do, but these guys have a really nice a nice front called the tapetum lucidum, okay? and it's actually behind the retina, which actually reflects the light really, really well in their eyes. Um, when we did the dissection with the sheep eye, you're able to remove the retina. You see the, the tapetum lucidum behind the eye. It's actually pretty, but yeah. okay. They also have more rods than cones, so they can see because they're sensitive at low color, low lights, and low levels. Compound eyes are different than our eyes, okay. Compound eyes are the eyes that are of many, many small units. And if you take a look at this, you can probably guess that these are the eyes that are in insects, crustaceans, lobsters, those types of things. Okay? Humans don't have compound Birds don't have compound eyes. There will be a when it says these eyes have a compound eye. Please say a cat has a compound eye. Make sure you know it's the lobster or maybe the shrimp or the fly or the bee, those types of things. Okay? Each individual unit of I'm um, sorry, each individual individual unit of a compound eye is called an omatidium. Okay, it's kind of a fun word I make all you guys say. Say omatidium, omatidium. Okay, and it's like a long tube right here. If you take a look at this long tube that has a focusing lens, okay, and then out on the outside, it has a, a sort of mosaic shape. It also has pigment cells, light sensitive cells, and then a nerve to brain. Okay, and then there's a nice picture of a compound eye. Take a look at that. It looks like that Simpsons episode where it turns into a fly. Okay. Insect eyes tend to have a convex surface. Okay. So remember we were talking about convex mirrors, how you can use them in security mirrors so you can see all around from all the locations. And uh, the omatidia lenses focus in almost all directions. That's why it's so hard to catch a fly or a swat of fly. They direct motion very, very well. Okay. But it's difficult for them to do one single image. So it's almost a mosaic image. They see you and towards them, they see each of you. Okay, okay so um, that was for this topic. I will be giving you guys some patient questions um, to answer on these, maybe a comparison. There will be a quiz uh, that around, uh, goes along with this. Um, there's not going to be too much for. Um, projects or assignments, but I'll, I'll probably try to come up with something for you guys to do. Um, and yeah, that's it. So uh, I hope you have a good one. We will see you. Please email me if you have any questions. Have a good day.